and uh, Tony will answer. I'll do my best to answer. I'm not going to say I'm going to answer for everything. I'll do my best. What, and some of them are a little hard to read, what are the map boundaries of the Lake Mojave Ranchos Fire District and will there be a map made for the community? That is a very good question. Um, can you repeat that question? I can. No, oh. Tony. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can read it. <laughs> what are the map boundaries of the Rancho Mojave Fire District and will there be a map made for the community? Um, I have not yet found a map which maps out our actual borders. I do have a map in my office from the county uh, map department um, that has the fire district in it. Uh, if it's an, uh, I don't know as of yet when that map was printed and if it's current as of yet. As far as making maps for the community, um, that costs money. And we don't have money to spend on maps. So if, you, if I can point you in the right direction of where to get the map, and you want to pay for to have a map made, um, that would be up to you. A lot of the real estate companies uh, used to make maps of the communities that they sold property in, and they used to give those out for free as part of advertisement. I don't know if our local real estate agents have any of those. Okay. When will White Hills get a fire department? <laughs> when will White Hills get a fire department? I'll give you the single ones with the ones that are multiple. Um, that question I cannot answer for you. Uh, that is a question between White Hills as a community. If White Hills as a community wanted to form their own fire district, they could look into uh, that. There are some issues, uh, there's been some things brought to my attention about White Hills, I'm call it issues, I'm sorry, um, about looking into White Hills and looking at what we can do to improve service in White Hills. Whether or not it's going to be done through the Lake Mojave Ranchos Fire District or whether or not it will be assisting or guiding them into forming something of their own or maybe branching something out into the White Hills area. Uh, it's a, for people that live in White Hills, it's a far cry from here to there. It's a long response time. Um, finally, and I just keep reiterating the same thing. Financially, we couldn't put a fire truck and a fire station out there. The call volume uh, just does not justify it. We do not collect taxes from the White Hills area. None of the taxes that are paid in White Hills come to this fire district. Okay. So any responses that we are doing to White Hills right now are being done um, for free. Besides the ambulance service, which the ambulance CO is a complete separate issue from the fire trucks. Um, if you guys don't know that. Uh, the fire district has the fire district boundaries. The ambulance, we operate a CON, which is called a certificate of necessity. That has a whole nother set of boundaries on its own that is regulated by the Arizona State Department of Health Services, which we operate under. So we do cover from milepost one to milepost 53, I think, on Highway 93. Our CON coverage area is very large. Um, I've heard estimates of somewhere 2,000 miles, square miles, I don't know if that's accurate, but it is very large. But most of the area that we do cover is desert. And we don't run rabbits. <laughs> They're not people. All right. We need CPR classes in Dolan. When can that, uh, I'm trying to paraphrase this, what I'm thinking it is. When can they be arranged, yes. CPR classes? That's a very good question. Uh, one of my many certifications is I am a certified CPR instructor. I just renewed my certification last week. So, uh, if that is something that the community is interested in doing, that is something that I can definitely make happen. My wife is also a certified CPR instructor. Um, what we will try to do is if it's a community-based need, we will uh, do it for free. 
And anybody that wants to come and learn CPR, uh, we can do that. Um, uh, what I would suggest doing is um, if anybody that is interested in doing a CPR class, uh, they would email us, email us at our main uh, email address, which is what, LMF, LMRFD at sitlink.net, LMRFD at sitlink.net, leave us your name and your phone number and an email address we can get back to you. When we do CPR classes, we like to have a minimum of four. If we have one instructor, we can do a maximum of eight. When we do community classes, we can try to stretch the borders a little bit because we're teaching a layperson class and we're not teaching a healthcare provider class. Also, the American Heart Association does do CPR classes online now. Um, you can almost do a complete CPR class for healthcare providers online. It's called Heart Code. And um, basically, when I teach through the hospital, all I do is I assess that person's ability to do CPR physically and I sign them off. Everything else they've done, they've done online, which includes their testing, their classroom skills, and everything else. So if anybody else is interested in that portion of it, you can look at the American Heart Association's website and look up the heart code courses and you can do them online. Pardon me, is that SIT, S-I-T link? C-I-T, I'm C -I -T. sorry, yes, C-I-T dot L-I-N-K, no, C-I-T L-I-N-K dot, I'm gonna screw this up all day long. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any plans of being able to collect the 30% of taxes not being paid? Are there any uh, Are there any plans of being able to collect the 30% of taxes that are not being paid? I can't do it. <laughs> That's up to the county treasurer's office. I mean, you can kind of browbeat your neighbor into paying his taxes, but the fire district doesn't have any authority on that on that front. Um, that's strictly a county issue. Um, you know, you don't pay your taxes, your stuff goes into lien, somebody buys your tax lien, then they take you to court and they steal your property. Yes. There's, there's really nothing we can do about that. It's just encourage the public to pay their taxes. And if all we're not getting is 30%, we're doing pretty good. I think it's probably way more than that that we're not collecting. <laughs> Can a person or group have fundraisers to donate to the fire department for the downtime, downtime income period? I can help you answer that if you want. Yes, anybody can have a fundraiser anytime they so choose, right? Um, if you would like to donate any amount of money, whether it be a dollar, whether it be a hundred dollars, to the fire district, that can be done. Um, GoFundMe is a good one. I somebody mentioned that real earlier. Um, because we are a special taxing district. Special taxing. I don't know that it's legal for the Lake Mahogany Ranchos Fire District to open up a GoFundMe page. That may be illegal. Yes. Okay. But for somebody from the public to go open up a GoFundMe page to say, go help my fire department, not go help my Lake Mojave Ranchos fire department, <laughs> that's possible. Um, probable, I'm not too sure. But I, I, I would almost bet that it probably would be illegal for the district to open up a GoFundMe page. That's correct. But fundraisers, if you guys want to have a fundraiser and donate the proceeds to the district, that is fine. If you want to have a fundraiser, and you want to collect funds for a specific item that you want to see the district have or purchase, we will earmark those funds for that specific item. I don't have a problem doing that. Two, question, two questions the same, but uh, worded differently. What is our current staffing level, full-time, part-time? What are the existing services? <clears throat> okay. Our current staffing levels are, we have, including myself, uh, four full-time paid employees. Uh, the rest of the employees that you see working here are paid on call employees from other fire districts that come up here on their days off and work for us. 
our existing services are at station 41, which is our station here in Dolan Springs. That station is manned 24-7, 365. Um, my services are Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, and I'm usually here a lot longer than that. Um, when they're, right now we have some holes in our staffing, and I have been filling in those holes. I will come and book a shift during those days. Um, having all POCs is a good thing. It saves the district a lot of money in insurance. It saves the district a lot of money in public safety retirement system. Uh, the downside to that is we end up with holes in our staffing. So minimum staffing for the Lake Mojave Ranchers Fire District is two people at Station 41. They run fire and EMS concurrently. When we have a good day, we have three people here. We have two people here at Station 41. We have one person in need view at Station 43, usually an EMT. Uh, part of my plan, and I know that this has brought, been brought up uh, by the MCA and some of the community members in need view, is we have an extra paramedic. We're gonna put that extra paramedic in need view. And that way they have a, 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 an advanced level of care uh, at their station instead of a basic level of care. We have some really good guys that are working out here, they're really sharp, and they're on top of their game. And they are very good, and I trust them with my life. And these guys know how to recognize an emergency. What we're doing in need you with the one person is to recognize the emergency, do the treatment that we can, and figure out if we need to call a helicopter or continue the ambulance from NOLA. Can I answer all those questions? Part-time, I'm sorry, part-time, I don't know exactly how many members we have part-time right now. Um, it's better than a half a dozen, and I'm working on a lot more. If the finance issues come up again, how can a fire station be closed with a school in the area? <clears throat> that is a very good question. Um, the financing issue hopefully will not come up again because this will be a revolving line of credit, which means it'll be there for us whenever we need it. It's not gonna go away, it's not gonna be taken away from us. Um, with the school in the area, I actually did go up uh, uh, last week and spoke to the principal and asked her if she knew what was going on about the fire district, and this was before I knew we got the financing assured. Um, and we had a little discussion, and she didn't really know what was going on. Um, she wanted to talk to the school superintendent and uh, find out just exactly what would happen to the school, because we weren't sure. Would the school be able to operate without a fire district in place, or would it have to close? Definitely don't want to see your school close by any means. Um, I kind of went back to, you know, back on the little house on the prairie, the little red schoolhouse. They were running schools way before there were fire districts and paramedics, so... Yeah. I wasn't sure on that, but you know, we're in a whole different situation. But to answer your question, I don't know if the school, what would happen to the school if the fire district did close its doors. I will find out because I'm gonna have another conversation uh, with your with the principal of the school later on this week because I want to bring her up to date on uh, the financing. Uh, these next questions have to do with volunteers, and I'll read them all. There's not many, but they're all kind of worded differently. Are we going back to a volunteer fire department till we are out of the woods? How do you see volunteers <coughs> working in with your department? How could your how could former military firefighters help your department? I am not a firefighter or EMT paramedic. How can I help volunteer at Lake Mojave Rancho? Will residents who lost their on-call, part-time, or volunteer positions because of mismanagement, favoritism, etc., be reinstated and retained if they still wish to serve the community? Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Okay, multiple questions. All right, well, I'm going to start from the top. Are we going back to a volunteer fire department until we are out of the woods? No, we are not. Um, we are working on, excuse me, we are working on a volunteer program. There are new federal guidelines 
FLSA laws um, that are kind of putting the pinch on how we deal with volunteers, how we pay volunteers, etc. We need to navigate how to do it. Do, would I like to see a combination department of volunteers and full-time people? Yes, I would. Volunteers are a great thing. That's how I got my start in the fire service. And I would like to see some volunteers out here in Mead View and in this community, definitely. Um, how do you see volunteers working with your department? And how could, you, <coughs> how could former military firefighters help you in your fire department? This goes for anybody. Anybody that wants to be a volunteer, you don't necessarily have to be certified in anything, but what you're certified in or what you're not certified in will dictate what you can and cannot do as a volunteer. Uh, currently what I am doing is I'm asking anybody who's interested in being a volunteer to fill out an application off of the website. Um, we have some issues that we have to work through as far as bringing on new personnel. Whether you are a previous personnel or not, um, we have to go through the application process. I have to run anybody, anybody that just wants to volunteer and help out, I have to run you through a background check. I have to run you through a drug screen. I have to have an application. These are things that I have to do by law because when you come and volunteer, even if you're not getting paid a dime, you're still going to be on our insurance. You're still going to be working in our firehouse and around our fire apparatus and around our EMS equipment. So I have to have these things in place to ensure that I'm not letting somebody come up here or come and work uh, that shouldn't be working. So please, come on down or go to the website, fill out an application, bring it into the station. We are collecting applications and names and phone numbers of people that are looking to be volunteers at this time. And once we get these issues worked out, we're going to start processing some of these applications. And I will be giving you a phone call. This question, I'm not a firefighter, EMT, or paramedic, how can I help volunteer? Kind of goes what we are talking about. Okay, depending on what you, what you can do, what your skill level is, what your physical ability is, we can find a spot for you. Heck, if all you do is drive out to a fire scene in the middle of the night and bring the guys some water and some sandwiches, I'd be happy. That's a volunteer. I'm good with that. All right, will residents who lost their on-call, part-time, or volunteer positions because of mismanagement, favoritism, etc., be reinstated and retained if they still work, wish to serve the community. Kind of falls in line. Um, I'm sorry that you were excommunicated from the fire department. <laughs> if you want to come back in and you're not currently on the roll, I cannot bring you back in without going through the hiring process all over again. Fill the out application. <coughs> getting your certifications, your current certifications, all your copies. If I have your personnel file and everything is current, we can look at that. If I need to update stuff, we can look at that, but I still have to start from square one. We are basically, with the new fire board and with myself, or if they choose someone else, you're basically, even though we have the same name, we're starting all over from scratch. Okay, unfortunately, most of all the employees got let go. I know there's some that want to come back, and I'd be more than happy to welcome, welcome you guys back but we have to go through the process. I would have to do a new fingerprint card, new background checks, new drug screens, the whole nine years. I, I, I hope I answered your questions. If you have any more questions, you guys can contact me at my office. Uh, there's a couple of questions here that we've kind of already talked about. One of them, how many fire, firemen on duty at one time around the clock, if not enough to enter not, if not enough to enter, will the department be seeking volunteers? I'm pretty sure that's what that says. I think you, I think you pretty much answered that by telling how many people were. Yes. And does it say enter? It says enter. I, I think I don't, if not enough to enter, I'm I'm assuming they might mean enter a fire, but I don't. I don't want to. I mean, if you want to make yourself known. Yeah, entering a burning building. Okay, entering a burning building, right. You're talking about the yeah, uh, you two in, two in, you're talking about the two in, two out rule, yeah. is that correct? Yes. Okay. That's what I was wondering about. Okay. 
Uh, currently, the 282 out rule, we, we cannot enter a building. Okay? We would, in a, in a structure of fire situation, we are going to immediately call for mutual aid. Okay? Mutual aid is going to come. The closest place is going to be coming from Golden Map. If we need to make a rescue, if it's a life and safety issue and it's safe enough for somebody to enter in a building, and this is explained in NFPA, you can go on NFPA and look at it. If I can open up a door and I can see somebody and I can reach in and grab them, I can get them. Okay? Um, the two in, two out rule was created. It is not a law. NFPA is not a law. We have not, as far as I know, the Dolan Springs Fire District has not adopted NFPA. So, it becomes an issue of safety. What is safe for the firefighters? We do a lot of dangerous work. <laughs> save a little. You, you risk a lot to save a lot. You risk nothing to save nothing. Okay? And it's, it's, a, it's a very, very harsh reality that we have to deal with. Is if we can enter a building to save somebody. How far gone is that building? What is the survivability of that person? So, but it's a valid question. We're going to try to work towards that. If I can get a good core group of volunteers and I can set up four people on scene, I can do two in and two out. As long as I have a safety out, uh, a RIT crew. That was my point then. Okay. Abuse the volunteers and use that common knowledge. Right? And in order to use a volunteer as part of a RIT crew, they would have to be trained to be a firefighter. It wouldn't be the guy that just wants to come and help out. Okay, very good. Very good question, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, something about personnel again. Considering different days off and other scheduling issues, how many POCs, that's paid on call, are required to fill a full-time position? Not sure. Okay. Uh, POCs, uh, there's a couple of them that are kind of filling in uh, full-time positions. Um, but by law, they have to manage the number of hours that they work. So our POCs are not filling full-time positions. So if you wanted to put that in context, let me see if I can... We have nine positions at the Lake Mojave Ranchers Fire District, okay? Three people, three different shifts. So that's nine positions. We have three full-time people working currently not including myself since I'm day shift. So that's six positions that are being filled by POCs. They are not required to fill any position, or to fill any specific days. We are asking these gentlemen to come out here. They're giving us what they can. To, to clarify that, Tony, how many POCs do you have that you can call from? I believe that that question was answered, asked already, and I don't have the specific number of POCs. Um, but I am going to be doing a recruitment drive because we need more. I need to bring some more people in here. Will the department service those who do not pay in? And what about ambulance service? And then in parentheses, that says splitting. Oh, uh, and the last question you've already answered has to do with personnel. Okay, well, the fire department service those who not, do not pay in. Um, I think that means like if you're not in our district and you don't pay fire district tax. If we, when we go out of district, it depends on do we have the manpower and the availability to go out of district? Um, there are some calls uh, that we may or may not be able to handle out of district. Will we come if we can? Absolutely. Will we help if we can? Absolutely. That's what we're in the business to do. Whether you're in the fire district or not. Now, if you're outside the fire district and we come to your house and we put your house out, we do have the option to bill you for those services. It hasn't been a standard operating procedure of the district to build. But we do have the authority and the option to build for out-of-district responses. For out-of-district responses along the highway, if you look at your tax bill, there's a little 
thing on there you pay into, it's called FDAT, Fire District Assistance Tax. Whether you're in Dolan Springs or whether you're in Kingman or whether you're in Phoenix, if you're a resident of Arizona, you pay into FDAP. FDAP is to offset costs for out-of-district responses. Very minimal amounts of money that we collect from the state uh, for going out on Highway 93 and et cetera. So we're looking into some of those things too because there are a lot of questions about FDAP, what does it cover, what can we bill for, what we can't bill for, et cetera. On the ambulance side, if we respond, we are an ambulance service. <coughs> we have our rates set by the state of Arizona, and those are the rates that we charge. We are not allowed to deviate from those rates. We can't discount them, we can't inflate them. They're set, they're set in stone. And whether it's the Lake Mojave Rancho's fire district that transports you in an ambulance, or whether it's American Medical Response Kingman Ambulance that transports you, the rates are set by the state of Arizona. And they're pretty much, I want to say, almost exactly the same for the base rate, and then you can charge for mileage as well. All of those are set by the state. Splitting, I don't know what splitting means. Could the person that asked, asked the question maybe, maybe clarify? I, I, I don't know how to speak yet. On the splitting part, if you have two firemen that are also the EMSs, and they're at a fire, and someone else calls and says, I have a medical emergency, how do you split the service? Uh, at this current time, we would split the service by calling a response from Golden Valley's ambulance. Yeah. There are two AMR ambulances stationed in Golden Valley, and they respond out here uh, when, we're, when we are on a call. Let's say, our, let's say we're not on fire, let's say we're on another ambulance run, and we're in Kingman at the hospital, and another call comes out in Dolan Springs, we immediately dispatch an ambulance from Golden Valley, okay? If we are on a structure fire, and I need medical assistance backup, I can call for a mutual aid response from River Medical, and they will send an ambulance to Dolan Springs, to sit in Dolan Springs until we have the availability to move on. A lot of fire districts, when they have a fire, they will call an ambulance just to stand by on the fire scene. Okay, does that answer your question? All right. Can a line of credit be overdrawn? Is there a ceiling on a line of credit? That question I can't answer at this time because I haven't got with John Flynn to find out, but I can almost guarantee you that the revolving line of credit is gonna have a limit. What that limit will be, I don't know. Are we gonna overdraw that limit? No way. <laughs> not if I have anything to say about it, not if I'm still here. If I'm not here, then all bets are off. <laughs> but I'm sure that the people that are running for the board and your elected officials that get elected to the board will be watching the finances very closely and not allowing that to happen. But we will know more once the line of credit is eaten. It is uh, kind of on about what you said, or what the question was about splitting. Billing, ambulance, <coughs> splitting. Do we call ambulances? I don't know. Building ambulance and splitting. Can, can the person that... Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm saying probably three years ago, I called an ambulance for my husband. Mm -hmm. They came out, they put my husband in the ambulance. They sat there for 45 minutes. I went out and said, why are you still here? I was told we cannot transport him because our air conditioning doesn't work. We have called Golden Valley. Golden Valley came out. In my driveway, they transported my husband from one ambulance to another. I got two bills. One bill from Golden Valley, one bill from you guys. Okay. Why? Well, unfortunately, I can't speak for anything I know, that happened two I mean, years ago. But there are certain regulations that we have to abide by. Mm -hmm. An ambulance that does not have a working heating and air conditioning system should not be in service. 
That does not mean that they can't respond to your house and they can't take their equipment in and treat you. It just means that when it comes to transporting, per the guidelines, we're supposed to have working heating and air conditioning systems. Why you got billed to, I don't know. Now there is a standby fee and it is authorized by mm -hmm. the state of Arizona um, and we're allowed to charge so much for a standby fee. Why you were billed the way you were billed or how you were billed, I, I can't answer your question. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be that way and if it ever happens in the future, then that's when you would bring your bill to the fire department and we would work that out and try to figure out what's going on and get it billed appropriately. How much does it cost per month to keep the fire department running? A lot. That's the problem. Okay. Um, right now, by going by John Flynn's numbers and what I've heard in the board meetings, and the finances are posted on the website, um, we're running between sixty and sixty-six thousand dollars a month to keep the doors open for the fire district. Okay. The third one. The third one? Yeah. It's, okay, is the second one not pertaining? Well, uh, let's read, let's do the third one and then I'll tell you. It's, how much money do we have at the moment to work with? <laughs> Ellen, do you have any idea? <laughs> About $250,000 at the end of February. Okay. At the end of March, or somewhere around two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Again, John Flynn is required that Ellen post all the financials on the website. Um, so you should be able to go to our website and pull those financials up. Um, if you go by sixty-six thousand or sixty thousand dollars a month, and you have two hundred fifty thousand dollars in the bank, that gets us out to about July. Yeah, that gets us, and that's barring breakdowns and stuff like that. I can tell you right now, I've got an ambulance in the shop that's looking at a $3,000 repair. So those kind of things hurt. Those kind of things throw a wrench in, throw a wrench in the works. But those are things that we have to do. Okay. And so, well, th this one here has to do with the candidates that are running for the board, and I will read it. But I believe that this this question should be asked at the meet and greet because I don't know if all the candidates are here to begin with. But it says, like to hear how each board member idea of how to form the new fire district, uh, excuse me, fire department. Uh, we, we have two meet and greets. They hopefully they'll all be there. And personally, it's up to you, Tony. I, I think that should be asked at the meet and greet. I think that's a question better asked to the candidates themselves at the meet and greet. I can't speak for the candidates. I won't speak for the candidates. So come to the meet and greet and ask your questions. Ask away. Um, did, did somebody say when? Did somebody not hear when? Yeah, or May 5th, right? Starting in meet view at 10 a.m. And then coming here at 6 p.m. Is that correct? So you have two chances. You can hit them twice. You can go to meet view and hit them in meet view and come down here and hit them again. <laughs> Just in case you didn't get your question answered up there. Okay. There's several on here, so. What percent of tax revenue comes from Meadview? I cannot answer that question at this time. I don't have the figures. How, how, what percentage of the tax revenue comes from Meadview? I don't have the figures. Um, I've heard a couple of numbers getting swirled around, but I'm not going to sit here and quote anything or anybody. What is the average response time of ambulance to Meadview and number of calls from Meadview? Okay, the number of calls in Meadview, I don't, I don't have. Um, in my chief's report at the board meeting on Monday, I will be going over the total number of responses uh, from the fire district and the total number of transports from the fire district. I usually do not break them up between Dolan Springs and meet you because we are one fire district. So I kind of clump them all together. If somebody would like uh, to know the specifics, I can get into the reporting program and within a couple of calls, I can probably give you those numbers. But it takes a little bit of doing 
to differentiate in the reporting program what call came out of Meadview and what call came out of Dolan because they all get lumped into one report. What was the, the response time? Uh, um, number of calls. Number yeah, of well, calls. response time and number of calls, correct. Okay. If I have people working in Meadview, all right, it, the response time is their drive time from the fire station to your house. Okay, if I don't have anybody working in BU, the response time is the drive time from here in Dolan to your house. Okay, there's, at this time there's really not much I can do about that, but like I said, we're trying to fill the gaps. We're working with what we have, and we have a certain amount of money to work with, and that's what we're working with. Like I said, that's one of the reasons why I want to get a medic in BU. I'd like to get a medic in BU full time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Whether or not I'm able to achieve that goal or not is another question. Starting next month, there are several days where there will be a paramedic in Meadview. He will be responding ALS. He can start treatment as soon as he arrives at your residence. So the treatment is started. Now, from that point, you look at whether or not you're going to require an ambulance or a helicopter. Helicopter response times to meet you are between 20 and 40 minutes, depending on the agency and where they're at. So within 20 to 40 minutes, we can have a bird landed in meet you, and we can transport you from the scene over to the bird. Now we are working on some logistical problems about how does one paramedic, all by himself in an ambulance, take a patient from point A, your house, to point B, the landing pad. Now, depending on the agency, we can land a helicopter in your front yard. And we can make your neighbors all mad when we dust them out with a rotor ball. <laughs> That's an option. Uh, option number two is what we're looking at, is how to get around that. It's how we get around, we have, like I said, we operate an ambulance under a CON. I have to check the laws and the regulations about transporting a patient from point A to a landing zone with, let's say, a volunteer at the wheel, a first responder at the wheel. Um, if it's, it's my understanding that if we're just moving a patient, we're not actually transporting that patient to a hospital, that we have the ability to move that patient from point A to point B. Okay, it's called an ALS intercept. But we're looking into that. So don't quote me on whether or not we can do it or not. It's one of the things I'm looking into. You know, this one here, you can use your discretion as to how we want to handle that one. All right. Uh, this last question I'm not going to address because it does state specific people and it regards a call that happened prior to me being the fire chief. I will be happy to meet with you after the meeting and have a private discussion about that, but I'm not going to answer it in public. This is a personnel issue, that, and this isn't what this is about. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. Any more questions? That's all we have here. I got a, a tough one. Okay. I'm concerned about all the people that are burning without burning permits, mm -hmm. and I know they don't have it because it's first thing in the morning or just before sunset, and tons of black smoke and who knows what they're burning. <clears throat> and I know you don't have a lookout tower or anything. No. But, but I'm like concerned the they're going to burn the whole place down someday. I mean, the wind's blowing and the, you know? If you see somebody burning and you have a concern, call. I have. I have. Okay. And they did respond. If it's outside of the fire district. Well, this is inside. Okay. Because there's been a... There's, there's a group of people uh, outside of our fire district that have been burning. A lot of heavy black smoke. We responded out there more than once. They're outside of our fire district. I have no jurisdiction. I cannot tell them to shut their fire down. They can tell me to go pound sand. Inside the fire district, we will take a look. As far as burn permits are concerned, they are free. You can come in and get them anytime that we are there at the station. They are valid for 30 days. We have certain guidelines that you must follow in order to burn. Now, that being said, I am looking into and probably going to change some of the parameters of the current burn permit guidelines. Um, 
There are several, if you look at our burn permits, they get real muddy on the days and the hours of the month of the year that you could burn. Um, I am looking at setting those from sun up to sundown. You are allowed to have a warming fire after dark within the fire district. You are allowed to have a cooking fire in the fire district. By, I believe there's an Arizona state law, don't quote me on it, and this goes into people that do not have the ability to sustain a residence, they are allowed to have a warming fire and they are allowed to have a cooking fire as long as it's done in a safe manner. So we have to be careful. Like a, like a burn barrel? Like a burn barrel, a burn barrel is one issue, but if you're burning trash in your burn barrel, yeah. you're not cooking hot dogs in your burn barrel. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, don't burn your trash in your burn barrel, throw a couple of hot dogs on there and think that I'm gonna buy it, because I'm not. I've been in this game way too long. <laughs> and if you want to cook hot dogs while you're burning the package of hot dogs that you just threw in the barrel, I mean, let's try not, let's try not to do it. And, and let me say something else. Household trash, you cannot burn. You cannot burn household trash. The fire district only has a certain say in what we allow to burn. EPA gets in the middle of this. Now, if I sit here and tell you you can go burn your household trash, and somebody from the EPA shows up at your house, and you tell them that I told you you could do that, guess who's going to get a $10,000 fine? Me and you. So, I'm not telling you you can burn your household trash. That includes your personal papers. A lot of people want to burn their personal papers. Okay? Shred them. Find another way to get rid of them. Um, we can't burn personal papers, personal papers, cardboard, painted woods, uh, treated woods, lacquered woods, oiled woods, anything like that is considered household trash. Those, the byproducts of the fire put off toxic waste, which is govern, governed by the EPA, which they tell us we can't burn. Okay? We have one last one. Uh, is, is life flight insurance available? I don't know. We, we don't have, per se, the, the, the air ambulance life flight in this area. We have Guardian Air and we have Care Flight, which just was re recently purchased by a company called Air Methods. You would have to go to those companies direct to see if you could look into a subscription or insurance service from those agencies. And if you have health insurance, I would call your health insurance and find out what they cover for an air ambulance. Uh, air ambulances are expensive. Yeah. Air ambulances are very, very expensive. But if that's what's going to save my life, I'm going to worry about the bill later. But to the answer to your question, I don't know. The fire department has nothing to do with, with uh, insurance. I think that's all the questions we have here. Okay. Just stick around. Well, but I'll take a couple of standalone okay. questions. Why not? Okay. Um, as far as when you go out on fires and you go out on the ambulances, how do you go know where each address is at? We don't. <laughs> you don't. We you, don't. You don't go by GPS or you don't. Oh yeah. Uh, it don't work. The time it doesn't work. <laughs> as you know. Right. As you know, the GPSs are not 100% accurate. Can, can time be taken to take certain firemen around to designate where our addresses are at? It's called area familiarization, and yes, we do do some of that. Uh -huh. um, I, when I worked out here, I personally I brought my own personal GPS and right. put it in the ambulance and the fire truck and I carry it with me. Um, it gets you there about 98% of the time. Um, the other 2% is, is, you know, knowing the district or knowing somebody that knows the district. Right. The other option that we do have, if you know, you have an address that's kind of out, off the beaten path. Right. When you call 911 and you're talking to that 911 dispatcher, you explain that to them, you give them rowdy instructions. Okay. And if I get lost, to your house, 
That's a you will get a phone call from 911 dispatch asking how do I get to your house. Right. That's what we do. Okay. Because as we all know, we're in a rural area. Right. We have dirt roads. Depending on one storm to the next, depends on whether or not you can drive on that dirt road. Okay? So sometimes they got to take the roundabout way to get to your house. What I did one night for it was I stood out in the road with flashlights and I laid on the airplane and slid it down for my neighbor. There is, there's a couple of things you guys can do. You can make sure you have a very well, a large, excuse me, a large posted address on your residence that you can see from the road or posted on your fence at the road. That's the most important thing is that your address is posted. So many houses that we go to and we respond to out here, they don't even have an address. Or the address is so small and such an obscure spot, we can't see it. So posting an address is one thing. Um, there are things, there. they sell them here and there and they plug into your porch light and they're an emergency light. And what you do is you flick the switch and it makes your porch light blink. So if the response is at night, those are the toughest ones to do, is the nighttime ones. Right. If you get those little things that plug into your porch light and you flip that thing on and it's blinking, guess where I'm going? Yeah. I'm going to where that light's blinking. Right. Okay. Yes, sir? Are you requiring inspections for the permits or are you just giving them out to anyone who says they have a hose? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question. Right now, at this time, we are giving the permits without an inspection. Simply because of the cost factor of sending the crews out to inspect each individual um, site. We have, right now, I think about 65 burn permits were issued uh, already this year. So you think about the cost factor of sending the crews out to fuel that it costs to go back and forth. Ideally, I would like to see each site inspected for compliance. All right, most of the people that I've had to go or I've come across are following within the guidelines of the burn permit. And if you see anybody that's not following the guidelines of the burn permit, please call me and we will go out and check it out. I ran into a few people that are burning more than one pile at a time. They weren't necessarily burning dangerously, but they were burning outside the burn permit parameters. Now in that case, as you know, we can revoke your permit if you don't want to comply. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. As, as you well know, <laughs> Pierce Ferry is like the racetrack to the skywalk for the tourists. And uh, if, do you charge like double the amount when they run into cows and stuff <laughs> and get hurt? No. <laughs> because they don't read the sign? No. Unfortunately, no. Oh, like I said, we're, our ambulance rates are bound by state law. Okay. We charge exactly what they tell us we can charge. And it doesn't matter if you ran into a cow or you ran into a tree or you just ran off the road. Your ambulance bills, if we have to go out, the ambulance bills going to be the same. I think it should be double for tourists. <laughs> <laughs> we, could get, we could get into a whole other meeting and debate about that whole issue too. I know. All right, is that all the questions we have? Thank you very much, Tony.